Good evening. Welcome to Saturday Night Alive. Before I begin, I would like you to know I'll be traveling to the United States for a uh, conference. And since the following week is a uh, school holiday, um, we decided that we would spend that week that school would be closed anyway and uh, visit family. Uh, I will try to do my posting, but I will be traveling between Georgia, Mississippi, and New York and visiting a lot of churches again and doing things like that. So if I can't get to it, um, that's why. This week at BIS, we didn't reach 200, but we're getting closer. We're about 195 now, and uh, we're going to be praying for those five more. Uh, and then we're going to have quite a celebration. It's, it's, again, what a miracle it is to think we've gone from 76 to almost 200 people. We've also created a BIS video, and uh, that should be finished. I'm hoping to bring that with me. So um, I hope that to have uh, that available and maybe one of those, these weeks coming up, maybe um, um, that will be one of my postings because I think it'll be very excited and help you to understand a little bit more of what, uh, about the miracle at uh, BIS. This last Thursday night, I preached at a large Pentecostal church and uh, due to busy schedule, uh, honestly, it's uh, instead of Psalms, um, usually what I would do is it's Saturday and I would get up and I would spend a good a good half a day working on Psalms. Um, but I left this morning and I just got back a short while ago from, uh, so I'm taking that message that I preach and kind of Americanizing it because it truly is a word from the Lord having to do with the church of today. You know, <clears throat> it's said that if you want to boil a frog, don't try to put them in a pot of boiling water, but put them in a nice, comfortable uh, pan um, or pot of water, and you turn on the flame. They don't even realize that the water's getting hot until it's too late. You know, this so defines America. I don't think you fully realize uh, what's been happening if you're living in the middle of it. But looking in, um, the water is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. In other words, America is declining, declining, declining. How, what do I see? What have I heard? What have I read? Many of the same things that you have. In fact, let me share a few facts that are taken from 100 facts about the moral collapse of America. So number one, <clears throat> in the United States, approximately one third of America has STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. Number two, the U.S. has the highest teen pregnancy rate in the industrialized world. Number three, United States has 750,000 registered sex offenders. Number four, 30% of all internet traffic in the United States is for adult websites. Number five, 89% of all pornography is pr produced in the United States. Number six, America has the highest divorce rate in the world. Number seven, since 1973, seven, uh, 56 million babies have been killed. Abortion. Um, all I can tell you is I would have loved to have adopted more, but uh, adoption is the exception, um, while abortion is the rule. Number eight, 22 U.S. military veterans kill themselves each and every day. Number nine, 60 million people in the U.S. abuse alcohol and 22 million abuse illegal drugs. Number 10, today 25% of all Americans have no religious affiliation, which is way up from 7% in 1972. And here's one of my own. Today in America, a person's sex is in biological. It's a, a a matter of how they relate and feel. Boys can use girls' rooms, girls can use boys' room. A new term is sexual fluidity. They can be whatever they want, uh, for however they, they want, whenever they want. I could go on, and I could go on, and I can be go on. But we, America, we were a country that was built upon in God we trust. 
Yet today, we really don't even acknowledge God. And the scariest thing of all is this has all happened in my lifetime. I was born in 1955. TV was full of heroes. But those heroes reflected character. Look at Superman, truth, justice, and the American way. In both schools and our communities, prayers were not only allowed, but they were expected. Sundays, stores were closed and churches were open. You know, I walked and played on the South Shore of Long Island with no limitations anywhere I wanted, including even walking to school as early as kindergarten. So what happened? First and foremost, it's got to be 1962 when we removed prayer and God from school. It's now illegal to have any organized prayer or mention God or reading the word. How, and, and how did that happen? Very briefly, I encourage you if you have any doubts about what I'm saying is to look this up. You know, we have a term that is law, a term that is accepted, a term that the courts have proven time and time again, and that phrase is separation of church and state. The truth of the matter is there is no such language in the Constitution. Look it up. You'll find that the Danbury Baptist Association in 1801 wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson. Their concern was the president was going to establish a national church just like there had been in England. Remember, Protestants came to America to flee from the Church of England and they were afraid of a national church. And President Jefferson wrote them back and he said, no, there is not going to be a national church. And then he said this, there would be a separation between church and state. That is the insurance that there would be no national religion. He did not say the church would have no part of our society. In fact, there was no intention of that at all. That's ridiculous and not based upon any fact. It was the Supreme Court some 150 years later, if I remember right, that misquoted that letter, misused that letter until it became fact that it is today. You know, courts have said, churches, you can't have a political message. And yet, when you really think about it, our schools and our colleges have political messages all the time. You can't be politically directed. And guess what? We, the church, listened. Why is the United States so spiritually messed up? Because the church became silent. So what's the answer? You know, I was thinking the other day about Israel in the wilderness. You know, they were surrounded by the enemy. If they had been, you know, um, alone without God, they would have been destroyed. But what did they do? You know, one of the things about Israel is they had godly leadership. Again, without that godly leadership, they wouldn't have survived in the desert. You know, you think of Moses, and I'm thinking back about how Moses, he had it made. He was adopted son of Pharaoh, but what did he do? In Exodus, Ex, Exodus 2, it talks about how he went out and saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and then he looked around, saw no one was looking, and he killed that Egyptian and hid them. Now, I'm not suggesting by any means any kind of violence, but I'm just suggesting that we do. We need to be involved. You need to be involved. I need to be involved. The church needs to be involved. You know, we need to do what? We need to be involved in politics and we need to vote biblically, not politically. Do you know, in the last Pew Research, um, they said 64% of Christians voted in the last election. You know what that means to me? 36% of Christians did not vote. And if those 36% voted, and if 100% of Christians voted spiritually and biblically, you know, the church would control every single election. But we got to get involved, church, locally, nationally. And, and I'm a believer in you know, you, you get involved locally and eventually you will control the national. You know, we need to find good, godly people and, uh, and, and we need godly leadership in this country. The second thing, you know, Israel, I, um, let God arise. And, I, and you know, I preached on God arise because I'm a believer in it. Psalm 68, one, let God arise, his enemies be scattered. And you know how before Israel 
in the wilderness before they left and before they went. They waited. They waited for the cloud during the day or the fire at night, and that would they would then get ready and and they would wait for one more thing before they began to follow the cloud or the fire. They would wait for Moses, who would shout out, "Let God arise, his enemies be scattered." You know, I shared how God is always ready. So it isn't an issue. God is. Are we ready? And we need to be ready to just let God arise. And if we do, if as this country, if we let God have his place, if we let God have his way, if we let God arise, the enemy, the enemy would be scattered. The enemy would go into hiding. The enemy and all of his minions would go into hiding. So let God arise. Last thing, there was also... Um, an expectation of God for holiness. That doesn't mean that Israel was always holy. We remember the golden calf. We remember in Numbers 15, 32, that God was even upset because a man was gathering wood on the Sabbath. They paid a price for that. In Numbers 21, 5, when the people spoke against God and, and Moses, you know, God blessed Israel when they were holy, when they did follow him, and honestly, they punished Israel when they did because God has a high standard of holiness and expects a high standard of holiness. That's why it says in the Old and the New Testament, be ye holy as I am holy. It says in Ephesians 5, 27, the Christ is coming to present himself a radiant church without stain or wrinkle, a holy church. If we want to be a blessed church, if we want to be a blessed country, we must be a holy church. We must be a holy country. We need something. We need godly leadership in this country. We need to let God arise. And we must have a, an expectation of holiness, especially within the church and within society, within our family, within our lives. Leadership, letting God arise, expectation of holiness. Let's pray. Lord, you know, I see in history where America's been in similar places before. And then we had the Great Awakening. Then we had the Second Awakening. And then we had the Civil War revival. And then we had the New York City uh, prayer meetings of the businessmen. And, and then we had Azusa Street. And, and I could go on and on. We need revival in this country, Lord. But Lord, we'll never have revival if we don't have any kind of godly leadership, people to step up and replace the people like Billy Graham. We need to have just godly leadership. We need to allow you to arise and, and we need to have an expectation of holiness, Lord. Lord, let, let, let the latter days of America be greater than the former days and and, and I admit, Lord, I admit, I admit that sometimes I have that doubt. I wonder if maybe there is no mention of, of the United States in, in Revelations because we are not even thought of at that time. I pray that's not the case. I pray it's because we're in such a time of revival that when the, when the rapture comes, the church will be gone and most of the country with it. Let us have that kind of revival in these latter days. And for this, we praise you tonight. We thank you for the work that you're doing. We're just saying, Lord, we need so much more. And we give you thanks in advance in your wonderful name. And truly all God's people say, amen. Amen. God bless you.